In this lecture, we want to give a, a brief introduction to the types of atomic bonding uh, that occur. Uh, so we're going to cover you know, ionic, covalent, metallic, and secondary bonds. Um, we'll begin by uh, breaking the bonds into categories of primary and secondary bonds. So your primary, or sometimes they're called chemical bonds, um, are, are your ionic, covalent, and metallic bonds. These are typically strong bonds uh, that involve some sort of interaction of valence electrons. So if you remember, your valence electrons are these electrons in an unfilled outer shell. And those are the, the electrons that typically participate in the bonding. Your secondary, or sometimes called physical bonds, are your van der Waals and hydrogen type bonds. Uh, these are typically weaker bonds, and they're going to arise from dipole interactions. So something uh, like what I'm showing you here for hydrogen fluoride. So if you look uh, in this case, the the um, you have one uh, uh, fluorine atom that has a strong negative component versus a hydrogen that has a positive component, and they tend to align positive to negative, right, as, as opposed to uh, aligning positive to positive or negative to negative, which would cause repulsion. So it's the alignment of dipoles that gives us those uh, secondary physical bonds. Um, before we talk about ionic and covalent bonds, we need to talk a little bit about electronegativity. So uh, what I'm showing you here is a periodic table and the elements in each column uh, they have a similar valence electron structure. Uh, hopefully this is all very familiar to you from, from chemistry. Uh, this is just a real brief refresher for you. So if you re recall, elements on the left-hand side are called electropositive, and they typically give up electrons to become positive ions. Right In the example we just had, uh, where we had uh, uh, hydrogen and fluorine, uh, the the hydrogen was the positive ion uh, compared to the fluorine, which was negative. And on the right-hand side of this table, we have uh, electronegative elements, and they readily acquire our electrons to become negative ions. Okay? So this is looks like the same chart, except now we actually have um, some numbers attached to it, and those numbers are um, the electronegativity of each element. And all the electronegativity is is a dimensionless parameter that describes the tendency of an atom to acquire electrons. Okay, so large values of electronegativity means that it will likely acquire electrons. Small values uh, mean that the uh, the element typically donates electrons. Okay, so just like this chart is showing you, uh, on the left hand side you see smaller electronegativities. On the right hand side you see larger electronegativities. Okay. So as we talk about covalent and ionic bonds, those quantities become important. So in the case of an ionic bond, we have a metallic element, which is on the left-hand side of the periodic table, uh, something such as uh, like lithium, sodium, potassium, and it's going to give up its valence electron to some non-metallic element on the right-hand side, like chlorine, fluorine, or oxygen. Okay, uh, and so what what we're what I'm looking at here is is um, an example of that. So here's a sodium um, atom. Uh, it's a metal. And here's a chlorine atom, a metal, or a non-metal rather. And in the case of the bond, the sodium a uh, atom is going to give an electron to the chlorine atom. And it's going to, the chlorine atom is going to become a negatively charged ion. And the sodium is going to become a positively charged ion. And they'll be attracted uh, together via a, a Coulombic attraction, right? So you have a positive and a negative, and they're going to attract together. The key feature that um, causes ionic bonding is when you have large differences in electronegativity. When you have that, that typically uh, favors electron transfer, okay? You're going to primarily find ionic bonds in ceramic materials. So um, let me give you an example of a few of those. So one example would be what we just what we just saw in the previous slide, uh, NaCl. Uh, so we have that sodium chloride, which we know as salt. That would be a ceramic material. Uh, magnesium oxide, MgO. And in all these cases, what you're seeing is a large difference in electronegativities. So for NaCl, you're having uh, an electronegativity for the sodium of 0.9. <clears throat> to the chlorine of 3.0, okay? We have a few others, uh, uh, calcium fluoride and cesium chloride. Uh, 
all examples of ceramic materials that have ionic bonding, okay? So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the bond energy. We talked about bond energies in a previous lecture where we, we had kind of a simplistic spring model. Uh, in this case, we're going to identify the mechanisms for attraction and repulsion for this ionic bond. So uh, as we've already said, the, the charged ions, the positive and the negative, they create a Coulombic attraction. And we can describe the, the uh, potential energy associated with that uh, via this formula where the, the potential energy is just equal to negative some constant over the R, which is the distance between the atoms. So the question is then, what keeps them apart? If, if the positive and the negative want to pull them together, why don't they just fuse? Like what is it that, that prevents them from getting too close together? Well, the ions are going to be repelled by polyrepulsion, uh, which, which uh, arises from the Pauli exclusion principle, right? Remember uh, back in, in the quantum uh, uh, lesson in chemistry that you can't have electrons occupying uh, the, same, the same orbitals, right? So they, they're, they're held apart by the, by the fact that the electrons uh, uh, can't merge uh, and, and, and take the spot of other electrons that are already there. That um, the energy of repulsion then uh, can be written as some constant over the distance r to some power n. And so we could write the total bond potential energy uh, as the summation of the attraction and the repulsion components where we find an equilibrium at the minimum. And we end up with this form that's, that just looks like uh, uh, E is equal to B over r to the n minus A over r, uh, r just to the one power. <clears throat> And if we plot that, we end up with a potential energy curve that looks a lot like the um, idealized curve that I showed you in the in the previous lecture on bond energies, um, namely that that there's some uh, minimum that that is the equilibrium distance, and the curve is asymmetric. Remember that asymmetry is what gives us the thermal expansion um, that we observe in materials, um, and then the attractive component. Uh, is due to Coulombic attraction, and this repulsive component, this steep, steep portion of the curve, is due to Pauli exclusion. So that's that's how we get the uh, bond energy curves from an ionic reaction. One thing I'll also mention about ionic uh, bonds is that they're typically not strongly uh, direction dependent. So really, they are relatively well described by this. Um, just the distance between the atoms, right? There's not a preference for uh, directionality there, okay? It's going to be in contrast to the covalent bonds that we're about to talk about. So that's, that's all I really want to say about uh, ionic bonds at the moment. As we move to talk about covalent bonds, covalent bonds occur when electrons are shared. So they don't just give up an, uh, an electron or, or receive an electron, they share an electron. Uh, in this case, each atom is going to contribute uh, at least one electron to the bond. And, and I'm showing you this uh, uh, for uh, diatomic hydrogen, where the, the, each atom donates an electron, they share the electron, and, and that um, completes uh, the outer shell of each electron. Okay? Typically, the bonds that inv uh, are going to involve valence electrons, just like what we uh, uh, had seen with ionic bonding. So the, uh, typically that's going to be our S and P orbitals, um, and which means that electronegativities are going to be relevant. So in this case, um, the atoms that are going to be involved in covalent bonding have similar electronegativities. Remember that in ionic bonds, uh, we, we needed large differences in electronegativities. For covalent bonds, we're going to have similar electronegativities. One of the features that's critical and that will play a role throughout this class when we talk about properties, though, is that if, if the um, electrons are being shared, that actually gives us directionality of the bonds. So I'm giving you an example here uh, where we're looking at a methane molecule. Uh, so it's a carbon bonded to four hydrogens. And as you can see, the, the angles here matter. I can't, I'm not free just to to uh, bring these two hydrogens, let's say, close together and have, have this be a uh, uh, sort of a skewed pyramid. Uh, this, is the, this is the stable structure. And so if I, 
if I change the direction, if I move the direction of those bonds, I actually ha I'm adding a bunch of energy to it so that uh, the bond potential uh, is affected not only by bond stretching, but also by bond bending and bond twisting. Okay. So where do we see these kinds of bonds? Well, uh, m most polymer chains uh, are, are bonded together via covalent bonds. This isn't between the chains, but the long chain itself is connected uh, in its backbone by covalent bonds. Diatomic molecules, like I just showed uh, up here with the, the hydrogen, water is covalently bonded, diamond, and a lot of semiconductors, so silicon, germanium, gallium arsenide, uh, 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 indium antimonide, uh, and some some ceramics like silicon carbide. So, uh, so uh, ceramics can be both can be uh, covalently bonded or ionically bonded. Um, but but these are kind of classic examples that I'm giving you here of, of where you would find covalent bonds. Okay, one thing I want to point out about uh, both ionic and covalent bonds is that generally. Bonds aren't purely ionic or purely covalent. So even though I've described them sort of as having separate um, characteristics, uh, typically they're never 100% ionic or 100% covalent. It's usually some mixture of those types. And we can characterize the mixture of those bonds by talking about what's called the percent ionic character. Okay. And it's a fairly simple formula. The percent ionic character is given by this formula, uh, 1 minus e to the negative 0.25 times the difference between in the electronegativities squared, where these X values are the electronegativities of element A and element B uh, in the bond. So it's very easy to compute the, um, the percent ionic character for any bond uh, if, if you just look up the electronegativities of the, the elements that are involved, okay? And it kind of kind of makes sense, right? If if x a and x b are equal, which means that their electronegativities are identical, right? Then the percent ionic character would go to uh, zero, right? It would be it would be purely covalent. Uh, so so that that all makes sense. Um, but anyway, this is what you should use when you're when you're trying to compute uh, the percent ionic character um, uh, for your homework sets. Okay, the final primary bond that I want to talk about uh, is, is the metallic bond. And it's a bond between metallic elements, kind of by the name. Uh, and in this case, electrons aren't bound to an individual atom. So the atoms come together and, and that outer, uh, those valence electrons, they delocalize and they form what's called or what's referred to frequently as a sea of electrons. Um, this, this has um, some some significance in terms of the properties that you expect from these materials. Uh, one of which is that the bonding isn't highly directional uh, because, because the, they're basically uh, metallic ions floating in a sea of electrons. There's nothing really to make it strongly directional uh, except that uh, sometimes you can get some directionality due to the D shell configurations in, in these metals. And I mean, I could give you some examples, but I think you know uh, th these are some of the ones that you're most familiar with. Uh, examples are metals, <laughs> copper, iron, tungsten, gold, silver, platinum. All, all the things that you think of as metals uh, are bonded uh, metallically, okay? So that concludes the discussion on primary bonds. The final is on uh, uh, secondary bonds. And secondary bonds, they arise from attractive forces between dipoles. And the, the feature here is that they're uh, very weak compared to primary bonds, okay? There's two classes of dipoles uh, that can be involved in secondary bonds. The first class is called uh, fluctuating dipoles, and all that means is that, uh, that the dipole is induced by proximity to other molecules, right? So the molecule might, might not be in and of itself uh, a dipole, but if you bring it in, in, uh, uh, in a neighborhood with another uh, molecule, they're, they're positive. It will tend to skew the electron cloud to make it asymmetric like it's being shown here, right? And it'll want to create a positive side that aligns with the negative side of another atom and, and push the positive over to here, right? So that, that creates some weak form of bonding just by an induced dipole. And this, this is an example of that uh, with uh, liquid hydrogen, okay?
The second class is a, uh, of dipoles is, is a slightly stronger form. Uh, it's still not, the permanent dipoles are not as strong as primary bonds, but they're, they're, they're stronger than fluctuating dipoles. In this case, the dipole exists permanently just due to the nature of the bond. If you remember back to the very first slide I showed you where we were looking at uh, hydrogen fluoride, uh, we had, this, would, this looked like a, a, fluoride, a fluorine atom and this was a, a rather a hydrogen ion and they would align positive to negative just because of the, the nature of that bond that it, 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 the atoms are such that there, there are, there's one side of that bond that tends to be more positive and another side of the molecule rather that tends to be more negative and those tend to align and give you secondary bonding. Um, an example of where we see secondary bonding is actually in polymers. So uh, I gave that also as an example for covalent bonds. So these are two polymer chains, right? The, the blue atoms are sort of the, or the green atoms here or whatever they are, teal, are the backbone, right? Those are bonded together with covalent bonds. But the chains themselves are actually, they have, they have as we'll learn in this class, they have hydrogen sticking off the ends that, um, that, that tends to, uh, have a permanent dipole, and so it'll it actually makes the chains bonded together uh, via uh, this the secondary bonding uh, uh, called Van der Waals bonding, and that's what allows the chains to uh, hook together uh, and be and be entangled, but they can also still slip and move, and and they um, well, that's why we also don't see uh, typically the, the modulus values that are anywhere near the modulus values of uh, our our molecules that are uh, bonded. Uh, exclusively with primary bonds. Okay, so that that's just a really high-level overview of, of various atomic bonds and and bonding uh, types. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to use uh, our what we've learned here uh, in the future now to talk about the structures that um, these uh, atoms and molecules will create because of their bond types.